My topic is the gold standard versus fiat money. And I'll try not to make it as dry as it sounds. Uh, there'll be some pictures and some jokes. Let me just start off with a chart that I came up with a number of years ago. I was unhappy with the way international um, trade was taught, uh, or, or international economics, which includes the monetary component. Because often what you would see is when they discuss the gold standard, they would put the gold standard under fixed exchange rates. So the gold standard would be one example of fixed exchange rates. And that would be right alongside things like um, uh, uh, fiat currencies created by a world bank, okay, where there would be um, a, a fiat currency uh, in, in, in the uh, view of Keynes and some of the, the later Keynesians, which would be issued by a world bank, and then individual currencies would be tied to, to that world currency by fixed exchange rates. So the gold standard was there, and then on the other side was fluctuating exchange rates. Okay. Uh, and those were, were rates uh, or a, a system in which different national currencies fluctuated in value against one another. Of course, this is um, not satisfactory. The key difference is that between a market supplied money or commodity money, whose supply and demand is anchored in the market, and a money whose supply is monopolized by uh, the political authority, be it through its central bank or, or directly uh, through the, uh, the government. So the best systems, from the, from the point of view of, of, of Austrians, if, we're, if we're, we're, we're using as our standard satisfaction of consumer wants and, and the ability of, of entrepreneurs to calculate, is the um, market supply commodity monies, Okay, and then things get progressively worse until we get to a world central bank. So having said that, we know, as, as Professor Engelhardt has, has um, told us, that all money originated uh, and must have originated, logically, as commodity money. So all money, in some sense, was 100% reserve or, or pure gold standard, copper standard, silver, or uh, in, in ancient days, cattle, and so on. All money came onto the market, uh, all general media of exchange, as some sort of a commodity. But we have the most information about the classical gold standard. Now, how do we know whether, whether something is really a, a genuine gold standard or not? Because I've written on this. A genuine gold standard, such as the classical gold standard, and unlike the Bretton Woods false, false or phony gold standard, um, the mark of, of, the, of the genuine gold standard is that gold coins are actually in circulation. Okay, They're used in everyday circulation. Um, it, it's not necessary that, that there, there um, be 100% reserves, though that is better. But, but, but almost from the start, when money originated, uh, governments began to interfere. So it's very hard to find a pure commodity money um, operating in history. So we'll stick with what we know best. We'll stick with sort of a slightly watered down version of, of, of a pure commodity money, the classical gold standard, and we'll compare it or actually, rather, not really compare, I mean, we'll compare a little bit at the end, we'll show the step-by-step -step process by which the gold standard was deliberately really destroyed by, by governments. I mean, that's Mises' big point, that the gold standard did not fail, it was deliberately destroyed by governments. So what, what were the main characteristics of, of the gold standard? Um, the monetary unit was defined as the weight of gold, I'll, talk, I'll give you an example of that a little bit later on. So that really gold and nothing else was money. Gold was the base money, okay? That it, it was the bank reserves and it was the currency in circulation. Nothing else was, was, was considered money proper, as Mises would use the term. Anything else that circulated as, uh, as a medium of exchange was a money substitute. So banknotes and deposits, to the extent that they existed, were instantaneously redeemable into gold at par or at face value. And they were the money substitutes. Okay. So gold coin circulated alongside money substitutes, were real, which were really, as we'll see, just claims to gold held by banks. Finally, 
It was not necessary under the classical gold standard for uh, a central bank to exist. The U.S., during most of the period of the classical gold standard, did not have a central bank. We were the last um, industrial economy to set up a central bank. Great Britain set, had a central bank in 16, or um, established a central bank in uh, 1694 or so, okay? Mainly so the king could build palaces and fight wars, okay? So, so central banks were initially creatures of government as they have remained. Okay, so the monetary unit uh, was, as I said, simply a, a weight unit of gold. Okay, so for example, from 1834 to 1933, U.S. dollar was legally defined as about one twentieth of an ounce of gold, which is uh, 23.22 grains of gold. The British pound, on the other hand, from 1821, when Great Britain went back on the standard after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, was um, from 1821 to 1931 was legally defined as approximately one quarter of an ounce of gold, okay, which, or 113 grains of gold. And then the fr French franc was about a hundredth of an ounce of gold. Okay. So notice something here. The franc, the pound, the dollar are homogeneous money or monies. Okay. They're not separate monies. They are all gold. Okay. They're all gold money. The, their names just denote a different weight of gold, a different unit in which the people in that nation um, calculated, right. but but the, the money itself was gold. Okay, and, and just here are the, the, the coins that were in circulation. I mean, there's a twenty dollar bill from 1921, and a, a five a twenty dollar coin from 1921, and then a five dollar coin uh, f from 1906. And since the British pound was worth about five dollars, four dollars and eighty six cents, as we'll see. Uh, we have the, the British sovereign, the pound, okay, one from 1894, and one from the last year that Great Britain was on the gold standard in 1931. Okay. So it's a, this was called sound money because it made a certain sound when you dropped it on the counter, when you were paying for something. All right. I mean, that, that's, that's where it comes from. Or that's what Mark Thornton told me. He could be lying to me to sort of <laughs> embarrass me. He's mentioned it a few times. He's a slippery character, so a lot of talk of opioids. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So the so-called exchange rate um, between the dollar and gold, well, I'm sorry, between the dollar and the pound was $4.86 per pound, okay, plus or minus 1%. So the way that that was gotten out was through arithmetic. 113 grains of gold, which was the legal definition of the pound, divided by 23.22 grains of gold, which is the legal definition of the dollar, yields you 4.86. This is no more a fixed exchange rate than is the fact that, or, 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 or than is f uh, trading five nickels for one quarter, or, or, or um, uh, five, five uh, uh, dimes for um, a 50 cent piece. Uh, so, really, it's a, it's a law of arithmetic. Okay. The U.S. dollar contains one twentieth, uh, one fifth the amount of gold as does the, the British pound, and that's why a pound was worth about, or, or exchanged for about five dollars. Okay. And so, um, for example, I, I said uh, plus or minus one percent. If cost of transportation between the Great Britain and the U.S. were about one percent. So that if you wanted to buy pounds to pay for something in Great Britain and, and you were an uh, American importer uh, and you wanted to buy pounds, the price of, of, of a pound could rise about five cents, okay? If, if it rose as high as $4.91, $4.92, you'd suddenly say, you know what? It's cheaper just to put, take American coins or American bullion, put it in a ship, and ship it over there, okay? I'll, I'd save money that way, okay? So, so there was this little, uh, they're called the export and import points at which gold was moved. Gold wasn't moved that frequently. Okay. You operated through the, ex uh, the um, um, uh, foreign exchange market when, when, you, um, uh, sent, when you purchased goods from abroad. Okay, so the lesson is that the gold, exchange, uh, the gold standard is not a fixed exchange rate system, okay? 
because all nations on the gold standard use the same currency. Okay, they use the same commodity as money. What about paper currency? Okay, so bank notes and, and government issued notes under the gold standard uh, were not money proper, but as I said, they were money, money substitutes, okay? And they, they substituted for gold um, in exchange as warehouse receipts, okay? So you were trading claims to gold. You didn't need to trade the physical gold. Um, it gave you greater security. Um, it was more convenient to, to carry around uh, claims to, to gold. And as I give you examples here, you can think of claim checks um, for uh, the dry cleaners or uh, a coat check when, when you check your coat at a fancy restaurant and so on. It was just simply a title that, that expressed the fact that you, you were the owner of the underlying asset or thing that was referred to. So let's look at some of these money substitutes. Um, prior to 1920, banks could not only issue checking deposits, but, but private commercial banks could also issue their own notes. So let's take one from the Farmers and Merchants National Bank of Los Angeles. Okay. That, that name doesn't inspire confidence, but anyway. Um, notice, note what it says. It will pay to the bearer on demand $20. That's not $20. A so piece of paper isn't $20. Okay. The $20 is that gold ounce that will be paid to you if you bring in for redemption that piece of paper. So people recognized it as what it was, and it was clear what it was, okay, just by what was written on, 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 on the face of the note, that it was a claim to gold. Um, here's one other. The First National Bank of Fort Myers will pay to the bearer on demand $5. $5 was legally defined as uh, um, one-fourth of an ounce of gold. So gold was, was the underlying money. And then even when the U.S. Treasury issued gold certificates, they put similar things on there. The United States, um, $100 in gold coin repayable to the bearer on demand. In other words, they would repay you your gold that you left with, with the Treasury. Okay. So let's talk about the connection between the gold standard and money and prices. So when, uh, in redeeming $20 for a gold ounce, when, when, the, when the central bank gave you your gold ounce when you, uh, in exchange for, for the $20, okay, they were not, as the monetarists claim, selling gold. Okay, they weren't selling gold to you or I. They were just fulfilling their contractual obligation of redeeming that claim to gold. There was no sale involved here. Because you, you, can't, you, you can't sell a claim against what it's, Claiming, okay, that, that's, just, that, that, that's just a legal um, interaction in which the warehouse owner re returns to you the property. So in the long run then, under a genuine gold standard, the, the money supply is strictly limited by gold mining, okay? Or, or as we'll see, by, by the, more, more strictly by the um, balance of payments for countries that, that don't mine gold. Okay, so you can only increase... Bank, no, bank notes and bank deposits to the extent that gold flows into the banks, okay? There is some wiggle room there. They can change their, res their reserve ratio. But for the most part, the money supply increases and contracts with flows of gold. And this is rational. This is embedded in, 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 more, in the de subjective decisions that drive the trade of goods and services and of, and of assets. So the result was that since we had a tremendous economic growth, let's say, in the U.S. after the Civil War. We went from basically uh, an agrarian nation before the Civil War to the mightiest industrial uh, nation uh, in, in the world by World War I. Um, there was a tremendous amount of, of technological improvement, of saving and investment, uh, uh, and the accumulation of new capital and so on, and that caused the supplies of goods and services to increase year after year. The, gold the uh, money supply under the gold standard increased extremely slowly, okay, much slower than was the increase in the supply of goods and services. So therefore, the natural effect was for prices to fall. Uh, and I, ca I, I call this um, um, growth deflation. This is a, even uh, 
mainstream economists today recognize a good, some, some of them, and some of them are actually connected with, with the St. Louis Fed and some other Fed, Fed um, district banks, uh, talk about good deflation or benign deflation. Deflation that results from, from growth, okay? You know, we were told uh, back in the, in the 1960s and 70s when Keynesian economics was riding high, and, and the 50s, of course, that inflation was always always a company growth. Growth was inflationary in some sense. Okay, that's ridiculous. Okay. Economists are, the Austrians have always recognized that, that economic growth is, um, all other things equal, deflationary. Okay. But mainstream economists, macroeconomists, are beginning to, to recognize that today and that that's not a bad thing. So just to give you the example, uh, we had a very gentle price inflation uh, in the U.S. between 1880 and 1896. Prices fell by about 30%, or almost 2% per year prices were going down because of the tremendous um, progress and material prosperity uh, in the U.S. economy. Um, on the other hand, um, real GDP grew by, by about 85% or 5% or per year. So we, we naturally had this, this fall in prices. So um, if you just look at this uh, uh, chart for a moment, you can see that the spikes in prices occurred during wartime because governments abandoned the gold standard, in this case the U.S. government, and resorted to paper money inflation. So um, if you see the first spike there, prices shot up, began to shoot up during the War of 1812. Um, it, it, they were helped along by the first bank of the U.S., which acted as a quasi-central bank. And then we had the Panic of 1819, which as someone pointed out, Murray Rothbard is, is the greatest expert in the world on because he wrote the only book on, on the Panic of 1819. Um, and then as, as, as the bank was, was not renewed, uh, we went back to a, a harder gold standard and prices began to fall naturally. Okay? But notice that that initial deflation okay, from the top of the spike back down to around 150 or so, that initial deflation, that's not a natural market-driven deflation, okay? That's a bank credit contraction. That's a destruction of fractional reserve bank notes as we, uh, that, that comes out of a recession in which you have business failures and, and uh, inability to repay banks, their loans, and so on, and, and therefore you have bank failures, okay? It's necessary, but it is, it's caused by, by, by gov government, by the initial inflation. Uh, and then we see, uh, until the Civil War, we see prices falling. Uh, and then they shoot up right before 1840. Uh, th that's when the second, second central bank um, created, uh, of the U.S. created uh, an inflation or encouraged an infl inflation. Uh, and we had the, um, the Panic of 1837. And we had a quick, quick recession. It was very deep. Prices fell very quickly. Uh, banks failed and businesses failed. But yet... Once we liquidated, or once uh, in the economy all of these um, bad malinvestments were liquidated and bad, bad loans were written off and so on, the economy went back to a pretty stable um, price level until the Civil War. And then we had, uh, in, this, in this case, uh, credit money inflation. Um, it wasn't quite fiat money. People did trust that after the war was over, they would begin to pay off the, the, the greenbacks uh, in, in gold. So, uh, and then, then we got the great um, industrial boom that we had um, after the Civil War, okay? And you see prices falling. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that there's a natural market mechanism to keep prices from falling too much in some sense, even under growth deflation. So uh, under growth deflation, and you don't see it here, but prices began to rise right around the late 1890s. Uh, and they rose all the way up until 1913. But that was a natural um, phenomenon because it resulted from the gold, uh, new discoveries in, in, in sources of gold, okay, and also new discoveries in um, how to extract gold from ore. Okay. So we had an increase in, 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 in gold production from year to year over those years, and that drove prices up again. But that wasn't all simply a technological, an accident where we found new sources of gold and so on. When you have a fall in prices, all prices fall, including the capital goods that are used in mining, extracting, and exploring for gold. 
So gold becomes more valuable. As, as, as general prices fall, the value of gold goes up, obviously, because it's the other side of the coin. And as a result, that's, that, that lowers the cost of producing gold, exploring for gold, increases the profitability of gold mining, and in that way, increases the production of gold. So there's a natural market mechanism that, that keeps um, uh, gold and, or whatever commodity money is in use. It keeps it from fluctuating too wildly in value. Now, that's not to say that it stabilizes prices. We don't want stable prices. We want prices changing. Okay, we have continual change in the economy. So the purchasing power of money, which is simply the other side of the whole structure of prices, it's the reverse of, of it or the reciprocal, um, that, that's also changing radically. Okay, we want to allow that to change. But, but sometimes Roger Garrison uh, has used a, a, good, a good analogy, and that is um, from the perspective of we people on Earth, the sun is stationary. We're moving around the sun. But yet the sun is obviously moving through the galaxy. And, uh, and so, so gold is like the sun in some sense. It's mu relatively much more stable than um, uh, prices of other goods and services, of, of, of single goods and services. OK, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, boom and bust. OK, there could be temporary um, recessions and inflationary booms un under the classical gold standard. Uh, it was possible, for, uh, because there was fraction reserves, for private commercial banks to reduce their reserve ratios or, or to multiply an inflow of gold by um, creating fiduciary media and to cause an inflation and to cause malinvestments, distortion of the interest rate, uh, bad loans, and so on, which then would have to be liquidated. Okay? So, there was some room for that to happen, and that did happen under the gold standard. Um, but it would eventually end, and pretty quickly, uh, in a recession or a bust, okay? And you'd have all the phenomena connected with, with uh, booms and busts. But what, what, what happened under a gold standard is that you would have a rapid decline in prices and wages. The government never tried to, 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 to maintain uh, prices and wages up, okay, until the, the Great Depression. Uh, so, so they fell to their equilibrium levels. Okay. But they were, these were minor compared to uh, what occurred after the gold standard was destroyed by, by governments. Let me say a few words about the um, balance of payments adjustment mechanism, which more or less ensured that, number one, inflations that did take place under the classical gold standard could not be too great, and number two, that as people increased the demand for money in one nation because they became more prosperous, money would automatically be redistributed away from nations that weren't growing as fast to nations that were growing faster, okay? So it had a natural distribution mechanism built into it. So let's talk about um, a, an increase in, in the money supply brought about by fractional reserve banks, okay? So they, they drive the domestic money supply up, and of course then the price level rises, the U.S. price level rises above world prices, okay? because of the, 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 the Cantillon effects, the, the, the money tended back then to be injected um, into the domestic economy, the new, the new money that, that the banks created. And then the second um, effect was, look, if the U.S. price level is above the world price level, people aren't going to buy as many exports from us, or exports are going to fall. Um, there would be an increase in imports from abroad because it's now relatively cheaper to buy things from England and France and so on if they weren't inflating to the same extent as, as U.S. banks were. Okay. I should have never put this animation in here. Then you would have a balance of payments deficit. Your, 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 your imports would suddenly exceed your exports. You'd have to ship gold abroad. The, the, the price of the pound, for example, would rise to the, to the export point. And, and, and so pounds would be very expensive, and it would be cheaper to ship some of the gold from the U.S. to uh, Great Britain, to Germany, uh, to your other uh, part, trade partners. So you'd have a deficit. Uh, and once you had a deficit, um, the gold would begin to flow out in payment of that deficit to the foreign countries. Uh, gold, banks' gold reserves would then fall. Now, at that point, under the gold standard, gold reserves weren't centralized at the central bank. So they couldn't use reserves to, to, to move them around and, and, and bail out banks. There was no central bank that acted as a so-called lender of last resort, or as I like to call it, bailer-outer of last resort. Okay. So, the bank, so what, this external drain of gold, the external drain was a drain of gold out of bank reserves 
to, as people came in to turn their dollars in because they wanted to ship the gold abroad, um, to foreign countries. There would also be the threat of an internal drain. As people saw gold flowing out of, the, uh, out of their banks, and they, they, they had the, 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 the money substitutes, which they knew were just money substitutes, um, and, and would give them the ability to redeem for their gold, they'd rush to the banks, and um, there'd be an internal drain. Okay, there'd be a, a, a domestic bank run. And so to prevent that, I mean, that, that, that didn't really have to happen. It, it just the, the uh, fear that that would happen would cause banks then to reduce their, uh, uh, contract their, the, their, um, deposit, their deposits, the money supply would be reduced, and, and the whole thing would be uh, reversed. You'd get a, a bust then, of course, because the money supply would be reduced, and uh, interest rates would, would rise, and uh, many... Um, Projects would be rendered unprofitable, long, long-term projects that, that uh, lengthen the structure of production. Okay. So the um, money supply would go back down again, and you would have recession, unemployment, but they would be very quick, and, and prices would fall. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the, the um, structure of, of what, what money looked like under the classical gold standard. Uh, let's, take, uh, the, 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 uh, let's assume we have a central bank now. For a moment. Um, at the base, you would have the total amount of gold in, in the country. Let's say the central bank held the gold reserves. You'd have, let's say, $2 billion. If the central bank kept the reserve ratio of 40%, then that meant that it could issue its own notes um, up to a total of $5 billion, because $2 billion in gold represents 40% of, of, of those notes. Now, the commercial banks, the private banks, um, who issued bank notes and deposits, would also want to back up their, their, their notes and deposits. And let's assume they, they uh, kept the reserve ratio of 20%. Okay, and in the U.S. it was 20 to 25%, something like that. That means it could ignore the, the, the uh, numbers in red font. Okay, um, so that means that with $5 billion of central bank notes, which acted as their reserves, okay, they could in turn... Um, create $25 billion worth of, of deposits. Okay. But notice now, things were kind of shaky here because you had $25 billion of claims on $2 billion of gold. So if the central bank encouraged bank credit expansion by reducing its own reserve ratio and adding another $1 billion to the bank's reserves by creating their own notes, um, the banks would then multiply the, that $1 billion five times the money supply would increase by 25%, prices would shoot up, and that whole balance of payments adjustment mechanism would, would come into play. Gold would start to flow out of the country as people, as exports became more expensive and imports relatively cheaper. So the U.S. would then have a balance of payments deficit. And to make a long story short, banks would pretty quickly realize that they had to reverse course and they would have to contract their lending and, and, and their deposits. So uh, th this inverted pyramid, as we call it, never really tipped over. But notice, it, it gets more unstable the more that the central bank encourages bank credit expansion. Okay? It gets wider and wider at the top on the same narrow base. Okay. So now let's talk about the step-by-step -step destruction, intentional, of the gold standard. So the first, the first step, actually there were, were steps before this. We had something called the national banking system, which tended to centralize control over banking uh, in the large Wall Street banks. Okay, so we were moving towards centralization even before this. And, and, and we were moving towards undermining the gold standard. But th there we have it, uh, right before Christmas uh, uh, in um, 1913, President Wilson... Um, signed the uh, Federal Reserve Act, okay? And notice what, what the uh, subtitle there, um, the subheadline. Wilson declares it the first of a series of constructive acts to aid business. Yeah, they left out the word big, to aid big business, okay, and big banks. Okay. This, is, this is really the agenda of the progressive era, of the progressive movement, was to aid big business. And that was the, one of the most important steps in that direction. Um, <clears throat> so let, let's move on to the next few steps. So the classical gold standard, as I said, existed from 1834 to 1933 in the U.S. 
uh, more or less. It got watered down during, uh, after the, uh, the enactment of the Federal Reserve Act. So the Fed immediately started mucking things up. Okay, it's mucking with an M. During World War I, uh, gold reserves were centralized in the Fed. So now you suddenly had the Fed able to out operate as a lender of last resort, which of course introduces systemic moral hazard into the whole financial system. Um, they placed a heavy tax on private issue of notes. They wanted to drive private notes out of existence. Um, and they, they stopped gold or prohibited gold from being exported in 1917. In the 1920s, they finally outlawed the private issue of bank notes because they wanted people to think of not gold, but a government issued paper, okay, as money. So they wanted the people to become familiar with government paper. To, uh, there was a big propaganda campaign, by the way, on the part of the banks and the government against using gold in the 1920s. You're old-fashioned. You know, who does this? Your grandfather did this, but you know, that's ridiculous. You're safer, and, and, and your money's more secure, and it's more convenient if you carry um, the Federal Reserve notes. Okay. So people began to attach the name dollar, not to the weight of gold, but to the piece of paper that was a claim to gold. Okay. So that change, Murray Rothbard stresses that change from weight to name, even it began to occur under the gold standard itself when gold, when gold reserves were, were centralized. And you were even discouraged from, I mean, you could withdraw gold during the 1920s, but you were discouraged from doing so. They would be slow in, in, in doing it. They'll tell you to come back in a few days or whatever or they, they uh, berate you uh, out loud in front of other customers at the bank and so on for being so old-fashioned. Um, and then, they, they, of course, they cut reserve requirements in half, fell to, to, from around 20 to 10%, and that doubled the money supply during World War II, and we had a big boom, which was followed by the last Austrian-style recession of 1920, 1921, in which prices and wages fell, uh, fell very rapidly, fell very... Uh, deeply, sharply, but the economy adjusted and, and moved out of the um, uh, recession pretty quickly. So uh, the Fed um, also expanded bank reserves during the 1920s. Now it was beginning, it, it discovered open market operations in which if it just bought government bonds from the public, it realized it could increase the money supply. Okay, so it did that to help out uh, Great Britain, okay, to get back on the gold standard. Um, we then had the Great Depression when, when, when the Fed hiked interest rates and stopped expanding the money supply as quickly in, in, in 1928, 1929. And we had um, the beginning of, of the Great Depression, and we had, of course, the stock market collapse. Okay? And um, then we had a, a, a bank runs from 1931 through 1933. There were periods of, of bank runs and bank collapses. So FDR declared a bank holiday in March, and then when the banks reopened, reopened with the promise that, uh, I think that it was about five days later, it was reopened with the promise that they would um, uh, insure all deposits that were in, in banks. Uh, and then in 1930, in May, a few months later, they outlawed the, um, the ownership of gold, okay, and then devalued it, okay. They legally defined the dollar as one thirty-fifth of an ounce of gold. Okay, they 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 reduced the amount of gold in the dollar. So there it is. Um, this is the FDR's executive order. Notice it says under executive order of the president, blah blah. It says all persons are required to deliver on or before May first, nineteen thirty-three, all gold coin, gold bill, bullion, and gold certificates now owned by them. So you had to deliver them to a Federal Reserve Bank branch or agency or, or to any member bank. Okay, so you had to turn everything in. And at the very bottom, it tells you the penalties for not doing so. Criminal penalties for violation of executive order, $10,000 fine or 10 years imprisonment or both as provided for in section nine of the order. Okay, so they weren't kidding around. Okay, they want, they want to smash gold. And in politics, nothing happens by accident. This is the words of FDR. It ha if it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. So if you were to say that to someone, uh, oh, you know, World War II, no, that wasn't an accident. In fact, there were forces, there were people who wanted World War II on both sides. Um, people say, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Well, out of the mouth of 
conspira conspirators come to truth. <laughs> okay. All right, so let me quickly talk about the Bretton Woods system. That was sort of the final nail in the coffin of, of the gold standard. Suffice it to say that, that the uh, system that followed uh, uh, after the 1930s, um, France in 1936, uh, and, and, and all other countries, the Latin Union, Belgium, and so on, they all went off the gold standard by 1936. The U.S. went off the gold standard in 1933, Great Britain in 1931. So we had uh, a system, a chaotic system of fluctuating uh, national fiat currencies, uh, and people each tried to make their currencies cheaper so that their goods would be cheaper, and they, they could sort of offload their unemployment by selling more exports onto their neighbor. It was called beggar thy, na uh, beggar thy neighbor policy. Um, the Allies got together when it was clear that they thought they were going to win the war, World War II, and they wanted to get rid of these currency wars, which we, we have today, um, by s putting in a system of fixed exchange rates but, and calling it a gold standard. Okay? The main architects of, of the Bretton Woods system, as it was called, and I'll explain why, were both the US and British governments. Um, and their leading financial experts, Harry Dexter White and, and John Maynard Keynes. Uh, White had his own, he want, both of them wanted a world currency. I mean, ultimately, they both wanted a world currency. White named his, in a in grandiose way, the Unita, to unite the whole world. And, and, and Keynes, trying to be clever, called his bank core, which is bank gold. Core is the root for, for, for gold. Um, I think in Greece, in, in Greek. But in any case, they wanted to replace gold. Uh, that's the kind of creepy and menacing place in New Hampshire. I visited it. It's, it's renovated. It's great. Um, that is the Bretton Woods Resort. Very plush, beautiful um, in, on, on the interior. Uh, but they must have been there that day, and so that must be the, uh, the clouds gathering. and <laughs> It's kind of diabolical. All right. Uh, there's White and Keynes, as we all know. By now, and I mean, no one disputes it, Harry Dexter White was a Soviet spy. So after the Soviet Union collapsed, they opened up the archives and all the evidence was there. So he was called to testify before the House on American Activities Committee. Uh, and historians now agree that he did pass secret state information to the Soviet Union during World War II. Um, and there's a great book on Bretton Woods by Ben Stiles, in which he, who's, who's no libertarian or uh, even a conservative, but he talks about uh, White. Um, he says, well, White wasn't really a, he kind of wants a whitewasher, but he knows he can't, given the evidence. He says, well, White was not really a member of the Communist Party. Um, he acted not simply because he believed that the Soviet Union was a vital ally, so he admits that, but because he also believed passionately in, in the success of the bold Soviet experiment with socialism. Imagine saying about someone, well, you know, he wasn't really a member of the Nazi party, but he also believed passionately in the success of the bold so, uh, Nazi or German experiment with, with, with Nazism. It's ridiculous. Whenever they talk about bold, when leftists talk about bold, they mean bloody, murderous, and so on. Okay, okay so you can look at his, his book. I recommend his book for anyone who's interested in this area. Okay. Um, he's got all the facts in there. He's a good writer, but he's got a lot of the good gossip in there too. So, David, that's okay. Um, what about the Bretton Woods system? Um, the key characteristics was that the U.S. dollar was now going to be the only currency um, convertible into gold. All other currencies were going to be f um, fixed to the U.S. at a fixed exchange rate, though it could be adjustable. Okay, if there was some sort of disequilibrium occurring. Um, so the U.S. currency was as, considered to be as good as gold, at least in the early 1950s, okay? Okay, we can just jump ahead here. So the other, other nations' currencies, though, were backed not by gold directly, but by U.S. dollars that they were holding, okay? Mainly U.S., short-term U.S. Treasury bills. Um, so now you had the foreign currencies being pyramided on top of, of, of U.S. deposits, in other words, we had a situation in which the U.S. could automatically export uh, inflation to the rest of the world. So let me just show you that. So there's a gold. The U.S. held more than half of the gold in the world at the, at the end of World War II. Um, so Fed notes and deposits, deposits were bank reserves, as were the Fed notes, um, were, were then uh, pyramided on top of the gold. And then you had the, the commercial bank deposits, because they held the Fed notes as backing as well as the, the um, reserves. 
um, at, at the Fed, that is, deposits at the Fed. And then the foreign currency and commercial bank deposits were, in, in a sense, pyramided on top of commercial bank deposits here in the U.S., okay? But they exchanged those deposits for interest-bearing government bonds. But, but as U.S. deposits increased, more money flowed abroad because U.S. prices began to go up, okay? We continually um, increased the money supply during the 1960s both to fight the Vietnam War, have guns and butter, to fight the, the Vietnam War, but at the same time to implement President Johnson's Great Society programs. So the whole point was, well, we can have consumers can have we can have consumers' goods produced, and we can have um, more military um, equipment and 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 uh, mach military machines and weapons and so on. How did well? How do we do that? I mean, the economies of a given size. How do we in in get both? How how, how how did consumers not suffer? U.S. consumers. Why, why, because tax rates didn't go up, uh, while, on the other hand, the military industries were expanding. Very simply, we, fo we forced the, um, uh, or, or, or fraudulently caused the Europeans to pay for it, okay? Because well, what did we do? We sent them, we had balance of payments surpluses from 1958 onward. So what we did is we sent them paper, which they then took, to, they took the U.S. dollars, um, the exported to the U.S., sold them to their central banks, who then bought them by creating their own euro, uh, their, euros, their own marks and francs and pounds. And so we exported to the rest of the world paper money inflation in exchange for real goods and services. So in a real sense, the Europeans paid um, for a, a large part of the Vietnam War and U.S. Um, uh, Johnson's Great Society programs, okay? Uh, and the, so, so the French economist, Jacques Rueff, who was a friend of von Mises, he called this a deficit without tears. The U.S. could run deficits every year, but since none of the foreign central banks demanded gold in exchange for the dollars, no gold flowed out of the U.S., um, at least until later on, which we'll talk about in a moment. But what happened was simple paper, paper money flowed out from the U.S., and then the foreign governments bought up that paper money to back their own money. They created new paper money, okay? And so we exported this inflation. Um, Okay, so um, we had what I've already talked about. We had cheap imports. The paper, mo uh, paper money went to, to uh, Europe. Um, France and Germany be began to get a little nervous about the fact that there was so much um, paper money, U.S. liabilities piling up, okay, um, and backing their own money. Uh, they, 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 they began to demand their own money back. So, so, so uh, or rather, their gold back in exchange for the reserves, the U.S. reserves that they were holding. So uh, Germany was more or less blackmailed into not exercising its claims to get the gold money back, uh, to get their gold reserves back. Uh, we, we told them, look, you know, uh, we, we can no longer afford uh, to provide you with a nuclear umbrella, you know, if you, if you continue in this course of trying to get your gold back. And we also had troops. I mean, it was an occupied country, so they would do what we told them. Uh, France, uh, under Charles de Gaulle, dropped out of NATO um, and started its own nuclear force because the U.S. tried to use the same sort of blackmail technique on them. Uh, and so here's the um, U.S. gold stock, the variations there, and the variations of foreign liabilities. Initially, we had $25 billion worth of gold at the rate of $35 per ounce in 1950, and foreigners only held $12 billion worth of, of liabilities. So since Americans could not uh, exchange their dollars for gold, only foreign central banks and uh, treasuries, they weren't really worried about that mismatch. But however, notice what happened. By 1967, after many years of inflation, the U.S. had lost some of its gold, um, and foreigners had built up all of these excess dollars they were holding. Okay. So that's when Germany and France began to get nervous about the whole thing. Um, uh, the U.S. in 64 abolished the, the, the reserve ratio for Fed deposit liabilities, uh, and then they uh, abolished the backing, the gold backing for, for um, Fed notes, which was, uh, again, 25% in 1968. Okay, we're trying to free up more gold to show, show foreigners that we had sufficient gold uh, for, for their, uh, to cover their... Uh, their claims. Um, Germany left the, the Bretton Woods system for a while in 1971. It was no longer willing to inflate its currency to buy depreciating dollars. Uh, Switzerland redeemed $50 billion of gold. 
And in early August of 71, Fr France sent a naval warship to, the, to, to New York Harbor to pick up $131 million worth of gold owed by the U.S. Okay, they didn't send a commercial ship, a regular merchant ship. And they don't want, you didn't want any accidents where maybe a U.S. military vessel gets too close and, and, and sinks the ship by accident. So there's the French. Um, no, that, no. Hey, I think that's Louis there. I know he sails. There, so the, the French, this isn't the French warship, but it's more likely the one that, that went there. Um, and, then Nixon, and then finally, to end, uh, to, to end this, um, on August 15th, um, President Nixon slammed the gold window shut. He reneged on the solemn U.S. promise and obligation to convert dollars for gold, according to the terms of the Bretton Woods system. So he, he wrote, uh, and you find this on YouTube, it's great. I mean, he, he looks ridiculous making this, this, state, this statement. I've directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily, yeah, the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and the best interest of the United States. It's just a bunch of garbage. Okay. <laughs> and so we, we see the... Uh, the, the um, price level after 1971, after we went off the last vestige of the gold standard, okay? The price level shot up, okay? Okay, and I, I'll let you look at these. We're over time, so I'll let you, you can look at these online. I have some interesting statistics about how badly the Fed performed. Okay, thank you.